Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today to our Art in the City talk tonight. Art in the City is a series of international artist talks co-presented by Fine Art UE Bristol and Arnold Feeney. Previous speakers include Philida Barlow, Jeremy Della, Martin Creed, Rose Wiley, Martin Parr, Bob and Roberta Smith, and most recently, Chantal Joffe. And you can actually see um, Chantal Joffe's talk on the Arnolfini website, if you have a look. Next week's talk will be by Imran Peretta, and in conversation with Ali Roche from Spike Island on the 18th of November at 6.30. So tonight, I am delighted to be talking to Heather Ajipong, a visual artist, performer, and actor and maker who lives and works in London. Her work is included in A Picture of Health, Women Photographers from the Hyman Collection, on display at Arnolfini from the 4th of December to February 2021. So I'm just going to give a really brief intro into A Picture of, of Health, just to give you a bit of context of why we really wanted to have a discussion with Heather today. So A Picture of Health introduces work by 11 women photographers, each presenting their own picture of health and personal story. This show has been co-curated with individuals with lived experiences of mental health challenges through a series of conversations and correspondences organized by an amazing local organization called Creative Shift, CIC. Our collaborators have helped us to look deeper and try to help break down the barriers of discussing mental health and well-being. So I hope this lends itself neatly into introducing Heather Ajapong. Heather's art practice is concerned with mental health and well-being, invisibility, the di diaspora and the archive. She uses both lens-based practices and performance with an aim to culminate a cathartic experience for both herself and the viewer. She adopts a technique of reimagination to engage with communities of interest and the self as a central focus within the image. In her television and film and theatre work, she's drawn to challenging and compelling writing with an intrigue for unique voices. Previously, she's been an associate artist of Black-led theatre company Talawa and continues to perform both nationally and internationally. So, Heather, would you mind just starting us off with a bit of an overview of your journey as an artist and how, how your practice has evolved? Yeah, so I think my, my entry point was quite unconventional, I would say. So when I was 19, I was studying a psychology degree in Kent and I just bought a camera on a whim, really. I went onto the Jessup website, bought a camera for 500 quid and that's kind of my first serious attempt of taking photographs. But during that time, I was struggling with my mental health. So the camera really was just sort of an outlet. How could I stop being so kind of insular in my thoughts and how can I project that outwards with a camera but then I was taking images just obsessed with taking images but when I was looking back at the images I was realizing that a lot of them were to do with really my identity so it was images of um images around like what it meant to be a woman and different sorts of women I was taking pictures of and like gender roles and what it meant to be working class I was I was at Canterbury at that time and I was just taking pictures of um, these kind of homeless buskers in these re really rich um, areas. So I was thinking about um, really how images have impacted my mental health. And I was really concerned about, you know, how does visual culture um, impact how you see yourself? And as I said, I was doing a psychology degree, right? And we were having this conversation, which everybody has around nature and nurture and how the kind of external world really impacts communities. We, we were talking about twin studies and all of that stuff, but I never thought about how that impacted me, right? And I guess a lot of that, um, I was just looking back at all of those kind of images I consumed and how they affected me. And one particular one was, you know, this sort of common trope of the kind of poverty stricken African. And we all talk about it now, and that's really problematic and it's, 
it's not synonym, synonymous with a continent, but really during that time growing up, it had a deep impact on who I was as like a black African woman. And along with my peers, I remember everyone when I was growing up, like we, I, there was such a like, with my peers, there was such a kind of sense of shame about what it meant to be African. And it wasn't about our experiences with the continent itself. It was those kind of problematic images coming, coming into play, like um, depicting who we were really. Um, so that's kind of really the f fascination between mental well-being and image making came. Um, so yeah, that's how it really started. And um, initially my work was talking about um, the role of the photographer as um, uh, in photojournalism, like in narrative building, does the photographer have a responsibility to their subjects? What is truth in, in um, kind of NGO photography, that sort of photojournalism and um, should we um, question, questions around um, uh, responsibility and authenticity really. So I did a project during my MA about, about that, but I felt that I was making quite broad statements about photojournalism quite negatively and I wanted to be quite complex in my approach. And I thought originally this all started with me questioning myself. So let me talk about myself and make it quite detailed and specific. And I felt a freedom when I started um, inserting myself in the images, right? It felt, I could say whatever I wanted because it was actually just about me. And that felt like a true representation of what I wanted to talk about. Um, so that's how my face is in all of the images. And uh, the last component of my practice really is the archive. So, um, and that's really because of just the lack of the kind of educational gaps I had growing up. You've, people have said this so many times, but we just didn't learn about Black British presence or history at all. Like I, all I actually learned about was Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, and the transatlantic slave trade. There was nothing about British context at all. I actually thought Britain were not in, involved in it. Empire was just a thing they just they just helped people around the world. I didn't understand any of um, those kind of con connotations around empire and all of that. So the archive, when I started discovering archives of like this Black British presence, it felt um, really important to my practice on a kind of educational. Um, uh, educational importance, but also just to ins as, as an inspirational sort of, um, as inspiration really, because something about legacy, me kind of unearthing these truths, these histories felt very empowering for me as an artist and really just as a person. So that's the kind of the bedrock of my work, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm so ashamed to say that I didn't know about Ada Overton Walker until um, I came across your work. And then, um, and perhaps, yeah, you'd like to give it, you'd like to talk about your Wish You Were Here series that's in A Picture of Health. But um, because of that, when I was looking up about it, it was like, how do I not know this? Why was this not taught about at school? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's oh my gosh, they're just massive revelations of like these rich rich histories that we just have no idea about. So yeah, Wish You Were Here is um, my current project. And that was birthed from, first I was reading a script and it mentioned the word cakewalk. And I was like, what is this cakewalk? And I think I'm gonna uh, just pop to a bit more visual context. I'm just gonna back that up. Um, <laughs> bear with me, everyone. Just going to share my screen. Fab. Okay, from the current slide. So the cakewalk, you can probably see the image. It's kind of a gif on the right. Mm. So the cakewalk is um, uh, a dance as a it's a, a dance created by African enslaved people, and it is a parody on white society, right? So. Um, often slave owners would do these kind of uh, dances, these celebrations on the weekends, and enslaved people would watch that and kind of mimic them and mock them, right? So that's the bedrock of that cakewalk dance. So the name cakewalk will happen later on, where um, after emancipation, black people started entering kind of performance spaces, and uh, there were these pageants where 
these kind of black performers would do um, this dance. And the person who, the group, the couple who were the best were given a piece of cake. So that's where the cake all happened. And then when black people started moving into more um, kind of popular performance spaces, minstrel shows, Waterfalls um, performances, um, they would perform this dance, but then it really became the sort of um, crude, rigid, kind of racist performance of blackness, kind of poking fun out of black people trying to be um, like white society, right? So that's where the cakewalk started. And then Aida Averton Walker really was um, this kind of breath of fresh air. She wanted to reimagine the cakewalk. So she was graceful, elegant. She was very technical in her skill. Um, she was also a multidisciplinary artist. She choreographed, um, choreographed a lot of these dances and she just flew to stardom really. And people um, really respected her, which felt, felt quite new in terms of black performers, right? And um, she was so famous, um, she was sent to Buckingham Palace to teach royalty how to do the cakewalk, which felt very subversive and interesting because she's basically teaching their own dance. Um, but also um, Aida really, um, she was very um, outspoken about what it meant to be a black performer and wanted to really um, talk about the problems and the issues, but also the kind of, um, she wanted to talk, depict black women in this sort of um, modest, elegant way. Because prior to that, there was this, either black women performers were either kind of hypersexual or they were kind of laughed at the butt of the jokes, right? So she wanted this kind of happy medium of, you know, we can be graceful and elegant. I'm gonna read out this quote because this kind of inspired the whole project. So she said this, unless we learn the lesson of self-appreciation and practice it, we shall spend our lives imitating other people and depreciating ourselves. So she said this in 1901, just, I couldn't, what? So, um, I kind of hooked, in terms of the project, I kind of hooked onto um, Aida, but I must say that um, I was commissioned by um, James Hyman, who's, um, who's the founder of uh, uh, the Hyman Collection and Claire Hyman. And he, so when I kind of discovered this word cakewalk, maybe five days later, James was like, um, I'm interested in commissioning you and have you heard of the cakewalk? And he showed me all of these um, postcards of the cakewalk it was just the most serendipitous mad thing because I was when I heard about that term I was like I want to do something with it but I don't know and then James like an angel just brought all of these postcards to me so these kind of cakewalk postcards were quite popular in France actually of um, people just doing the cakewalk black performers doing the cakewalk doing them quite um these iconic poses of what the cakewalk was a lot of them were raised arms and straight legs as you go through the images they get kind of more and more racist right so it's this kind of um uh problematic uh format depiction of blackness so i was thinking is there a way i can kind of reimagine those postcards how can i use them as a way to kind of inspire and encourage not just my community but communities which often feel like imposters um so really the um I guess the other inspiration behind Wish You Were Here was my kind of feeling of feeling a bit um, like I'm in a kind of a hostile environment as being, a, as being an artist, sometimes find it quite difficult to navigate for various, various reasons, kind of mental health issues, but also this sort of um, feeling of being like this imposter and often needing to kind of prove myself, finding it difficult to navigate financially, all this stuff. And, um, uh, Aida was this kind of point of inspiration, this sort of template for me to kind of reimagine myself in this sort of like ambitious and inspirational way. Sorry, Keiko, another thing I've got to say is that um, I wanted uh, the postcard, postcards to kind of act like postcards, right? Or greeting cards. You know, you get a greeting card which, say, which says, congratulations or um, get well soon or, um, well done for this. I wanted the postcards to feel like they represented um, an idea or a moti or a theme. So the postcards are about um, kind of subversion, um, collective actioning, 
rest and um, restoration, um, political satire. I wanted them to um, feel like people could have postcards and kind of give them to each other. And this, here's this postcard to encourage you to sleep more. Here's this postcard for you to feel more financially stable and feel more entitled. So the, the images are kind of packed with like ideas around self-care and empowerment. And this sort of, what I really loved about the title Wish You Were Here being a postcard is that it's not just based on kind of locale of I'm in London and someone's in Bristol and we're having a conversation. Also this sort of mental locale of Aida being at this place of feeling strong and empowered and little Heather trying to make work and struggling and her kind of, there's a conversation happening between kind of past and present and, and using Aida as a way to kind of encourage me into the future. Do you know what I mean? So that's, there were loads, of, there's loads of that happening. I'll show some more images. Um, yeah, it's packed full of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, the um, just to say the the one we're hovering on the spotlight on rest. That was one of the works that um, when I was doing the focus groups with um, adults who are um, facing challenge, um, mental health challenges, they absolutely drew to that one and was and um, they just responded to it so positively, just saying that it's so important to have these. Um, aspects of self-care around you and um, and that they were saying sometimes it is just that really simple thing of a hot water bottle or um, yeah candles as you put it or you know little banks soft blankets and they just um, totally resonated with that work. I want to be quite honest of my struggles to rest Right. I don't know if anybody in this Zoom finds the same struggles, but sometimes I find that rest is a waste of time or I could be doing something else or I just don't value it the same way. It might be a, being in London. It might just be being someone ha what's happening right now. So I felt that. That felt an important I think it's the middle image of the work. It felt very important to highlight rest mostly sleep but also things which make me feel restful right and also rest and recovery um I do a bunch of research before the images it looks a bit all over the place but there's a lot of research and um there was a I'm doing another project and I was talking about um a lot of black women have issues with um um fibroids and uh, issues with their womb and uh, this idea of the hot water ball trying to find some sort of like rest and release felt really important when in the context of Aida and essentially a black female body it felt like that's quite important in terms of restoration um, and feeling depleted um, and so a lot of people say they find the phone quite jarring but I actually I it felt important for a phone to be in the image because it's, it, I guess it's a source of kind of communication and um, community, but also it, it is the, for me personally, it is the thing, the barrier towards rest, right? And there's something about her dropping the phone feels quite important to start the rest to begin for me. So I wanted to be quite honest with myself about the challenges of rest and what that means for me personally. Oh, I should have <laughs> Sorry, um, <laughs> I was just desperately trying to unmute myself, but I couldn't. <laughs> Sorry, I was going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. And when you, um, this isn't the first time that you've embodied a character, is it? to sort of um, bring across something that's obviously re really important to you. Um, but can you sort of just talk about what does that process look like when you're, when you're trying to sort of, yeah, embody um, Aida? Yeah, I think if I go, go to one of my first projects, because it's quite vivid about that process, mm -hmm. I'll just jump to it. Oh, hello. Yes, 
So ooh, the first project I did was called Too Many Blackamores. And it, this was the first kind of idea of using a template of someone else to explore versions of myself. Um, really the process is quite intense. So this project particularly was about, um, there's this, the, the figure on the right is called Sarah Forbes Bonetta, who essentially was um, a princess in Dahomey, all her family died and she was given to, uh, she was given as a present to Queen Victoria. Her name was changed. She kind of grew up in this royalty. Um, and, the, and the project was about exploring um, kind of this sort of like strong black female narrative. And I wanted to, I wanted to talk more about fragility in um, depictions of black women, because when I was reading about her, she was depicted as this kind of strong outspoken woman, which is often the case when people are talking about black women, quite problematically. Um, but um, people often ask me, isn't it just you pretending to be these people? But um, often in the process, I work with assistants, a problem with the process, I'm recounting a memory or something I'm trying to ex excavate or expose, something about, um, I don't know, if, something about um, bringing something to the surface. There is a, there is a cathartic kind of um, uh, experience I have when I'm making these works. So I'm very much myself. So I, I dress up as the person and have this idea, but I'm, I'm very much Heather in all of these instances. So with, when I first started working in this way, I was using props to trigger a memory or an idea. So this project was birthed around, um, I don't know, I grew up really, I never had any kind of overtly racist experiences at all for maybe 20 years. And I was like, maybe nothing. I mean, small little things would happen and someone would say stuff. I was just like, I'm all right, actually. Like, nothing really happened to me. And then something happened in my 20s where I just had the, mo like, the most overtly racist experiences. And I was just like, oh, my God. People just don't like me because I'm black. Like, I just, it was new. It just yeah. felt like, really, is this such a massive thing? People actually hate me. And that really, I, that really um, did a number on me. Mm. Uh, so this project, Too Many Blackamores, is a reference to Queen Elizabeth who said there was too many blackamores in Britain, but also um, uh, feeling unwanted, right? So all of, so there's a prop on the left you see with a black cloak, that's a reference to something which happened to me. The shoes are a reference, so it felt like stepping back into the past to kind of, I don't know if any of you in the group have ever had this in the Zoom, where you've gone through a situation and you're like, I wish I said that at the time. Oh, I, I could have done that differently. All, yeah, the, all time. the time, right? <laughs> but you, there's always this kind of, you don't have any closure from that moment. So this project was really trying to kind of find closure in these times of kind of feeling powerless. Mm. Also, the end result would be images of black women kind of looking delicate and questioning their identity and all of these things as an actor, as an artist, I just didn't see growing up. It was really those binaries that Aida, Aida is um, trying to wrestle against. So trying to think about what is the in-between of that experience. So yeah, they're usually, I research for like six months and then the research is based on the figure I'm trying to think about, but also really excavating myself, what's happening with me, what do I want to say, um, combining the two. And then having these kind of a day of shooting all of this, it's quite heavy, but something kind of comes out from that process. Yeah, I wonder if um, this is a, a good segue to talk about your um, some of the artists that you're influenced by, because it some of the stuff that you're talking about really sounds a, um, a lot like um, phototherapy, where um, which was developed by Joe Spence and Rosie Martin, who are also in A Picture of Health. It's really a bit of a dream to be in an exhibition with Rosie Martin, if I'm absolutely honest, because, oh, she, oh it's just, I remember um, she came in to my MA class at Goldsmith and spoke about reenactment phototherapy. Um, let me go to, I've actually, I think I've got something. Have I? Like a wizard? 
oh I've got it yes who um I'll read it out because I also want to be careful and make sure I'm saying the right thing so phototherapy refers broadly to the use of photographic rep representations within a context in which the intention is therapeutic to promote self-awareness and healing so Joe Spence and Rosie Martin um, often used um, the photo album to kind of reimagine themselves in these fictions of themselves and other characters in their life to really get this sort of cathartic experience to get a deeper understanding of these things which happened I think this might be Jo Spence dressing up as her mother talking about that relationship understanding what the mother's rationale for behavior is understanding her own it's way more complex but check out Rosie Martin's work because it's really incredible and obviously I've come in with a four year psychology degree, potentially be, wanted to be a psychologist and then having this art practice. And I'm like, they, none of, they don't make sense. They don't mix. And Rosie Martin just changed the game for me. Like, oh my gosh, there's, there is a, they can definitely communicate and photography can be aesthetically interesting, have these intellectual questions that can also be like a vehicle, it sounds cheesy, but like a vehicle of change and a deeper understanding of who we are and asking these kind of complex therapeutic questions. So that's really where the birth of all of it came. So for Too Many Black and Wars, I use that as a rough template. And now I just, it's kind of just the inspiration of my practice. But Rosie Martin and Joe Spencer's work was just massive for me. But also I think when I was looking at, I guess their work kind of, sometimes is in this sort of kind of British feminist work. But when I was reading about all of these kind of feminist artists, often a lot of them were kind of white women. And when I was thinking about um, black women, it was always this kind of African-American experience, which was super valid and important. But I was like, oh, it'll be interesting to talk about this in this, in this with my lens. So yeah, that's all of that. Amazing. And actually the, the work that um, we have in the show, Rosie Martin's, is very much about care. And um, it sort of talks about her experiences of looking after her, her mother um, when she had dementia. And um, yeah, it's, it's such a fantastic raw piece. Um, I think I'm right in saying it's the first time that it will be shown. So yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but thinking about, I was just thinking about care and um, I feel like that comes out in your work a lot, but um, how do you, how do you protect yourself? Because a lot of this work is like a lot of the artists in the show actually is um, quite physically demanding, but emotionally as well. And um, yeah. H how do you do that as an artist, like make sure that you're, you're protecting yourself? I mean, it's such an important question, especially right now, Keiko, because um, mm. I think I think artists who make work which is quite personal have to be extra careful because the kind of space of where the artistry is birthed is, feels, is kind of where your emotions lie, right? And during this time, you can be drained very easily um, because of COVID, I mean, you're just, things are just sucking stuff out of you constantly, feeling drained, feeling empty. So um, I have to be incredibly boundaried because my work is really vulnerable and it just it will never change really because that's the only reason I'm making work. So I have to be quite um, self-aware, I guess, even in how I talk about my work and um, I've got to be quite boundaried in what I say because I don't want to, a lot of these exhibition, a lot of these projects have happened, um, have been centered around quite um, an emotionally intense time in my life. So even when I'm talking about them, I want to make sure that that happened then. This is where I am now, because when I look at the image, you, the audience will see something, but I have an exact memory of what that is. So just a bit of distance from the work feels important and letting it go. Sometimes I look at the images and say, that's not Heather, that's someone else. So that people can critique it if they want to critique it. The work definitely isn't for everyone, but there has to be like a separation about that. And also making personal work, you can often focus on the output, but 
during this this kind of mad year, all I've been thinking about is input, whatever that is, conversations, different art, watching EastEnders, literally anything, because I think any sort of creative input will, um, the kind of overspill will be another project. But if I'm not, if I'm not nurtured creatively, I'll make work out of lack, which is quite, um, which is for quite dangerous, actually, when you feel like your tank is empty and you're just making kind of knee jerk emotional work. Often the work, I've done that before and often the work feels quite um, preachy or uh, uh, just raw, it feels unstable. So there's that this kind of constant self-awareness and reflection and, and spacing and taking space away from the work feels really important to maintaining my practice really. Absolutely. And um, I, I remember, I think the first time that we spoke, you were talking about um, the Body Remembers performance that you're developing right now, which is really exciting. And we really hope that we can show it on Afini. Um, but you, you were just, just showing so much care towards the participants that you're working with. Um, as well and making sure that they feel protected um do yeah do you want to talk a little bit about um the body remembers there and and i suppose uh, the responsibility that you you have as an artist when you're working with um vulnerable people i suppose yeah so the body remembers was really birth just for context it was birthed from um i was thinking about trauma a lot mm -hmm. And there was this thing around the creative community um, the black creative community around, we don't want to hear about trauma anymore because often there's this kind of, kind of obsession with kind of trauma and black bodies, like constant slave narratives, black bodies in pain. And people kind of wanted to stop talking about that. But I was like, you know, trauma in the black community is really taboo, but also really not the whole, my experience, I'm going to be specific, my experience is that it's been quite taboo. But, you know, I started reading stats about, you know, black people in Britain are four more times likely to suffer from a serious mental health issue. There are um, really, um, there's a lot of distrust around uh, black women and healthcare services for loads of reasons. There's a book recommendation, there's a book called The Heart of the Race, which talks beautifully about kind of the issues of um, black women in different sectors in the UK, but also what people need to overcome that. It's from kind of the 1950s to the 1980s. It talks about black Panther movement, just great things that were happening during that time too. Um, actually, there was a report which came out like 1 a.m. today. I think it's called Black People, Black People, Race and Human Rights. And they're talking about black women are five times more likely to lose their child in childbirth compared to white women. And just there's, so there's a general, um, there's a general uh, tension around black people in healthcare systems. So artist Heather was like, this feels really important. How can I create some sort of intervention? So the body remembers essentially is around how trauma lives in the body. So trauma, can live in the body in terms of having aches and pains on one, on the one uh, side of the scale to having full on illnesses. So there's an, there's an illness called fibromyalgia, which, which is the illness is believed to be triggered by, from trauma, it's chronic pain, right? So I was interested in how the body can act as like an archive, but also how the body acts as like a prophet. Your body can, tell you if you don't attend to me something's going to happen right and me as Heather maybe maybe it's the British side sometimes I can feel a bit cut off from my head like be very cerebral and that my body or my feelings can feel really kind of um, an afterthought so I was interested in connecting the two and specifically in this kind of black woman um, lens right um, so yeah that, that's how the project was birthed the second component is uh, two years ago, I was saying, I want, I want to, I want my body to move. I really want to move. I don't know what that's about, but I want to move. And Fuel Theatre, who are my producers of this um, piece, 
got me in contact with a movement director called Imogen Knight, who's now my collaborator, and said, I was like, Imogen, I really want to move, but I don't know what, not dance, but move. And she said, have you heard of something called somatic experiencing, which is essentially like um, moving, it's kind of like free writing with your body, moving authentically to alleviate some of the stresses and pains caused by trauma totally blew my mind, started doing that practice and found real change in my behavior. As I said, I had, I had issues with my mental health and moving authentically, not dancing, but just moving, being led by impulse felt very um, therapeutic. I would highly recommend it to anyone if they, if they can do that. So the project is kind of me moving this sort of authentic way interdispersed with these 20 black women all ages talking about how trauma lives in their body but um the project the piece is definitely not a performance in terms of you watch me moving it's around it's about collective healing so the audience are called witnesses and they have an actual um they have a stake in the work there is a that something is being asked of them and the hope is that there will be a sense of kind of rest and ease and release during this um, performance. So it's, a, it's really a therapeutic intervention for both myself and the audience. So that's really the bones of The Body Remembers. That sounds incredible. Um, I really hope it can come to <laughs> And fingers crossed. Also, Keiko, I didn't answer your question, so I'll quickly do that. You? So you said... Um, <laughs> level of care with participants right oh yeah so yeah. that's it because of as I said this sort of landscape of some black women and kind of meant in um, health services I wanted to be very considerate in my approach to talking to these this vulnerable group I think you should do it in any group so it's really about understanding the landscape and people's reservations about entering these spaces talking about their health so I had um a psychotherapist who was with me all during the interviews and made sure, um, her name's Dawn Estefan, wonderful, and made sure we didn't kind of re-traumatize people by talking about the trauma, the traumatic events itself. We spoke about the body and made sure it wasn't about the actual event. Um, all the recordings every participant has now and they have an option to, to distort their voice so it's anonymized. Um, when we preview the work, the first time, because the, the work isn't fully completed, we complete it next month. When the work is realised, they will be the first to be invited to comment about the work. So I think it's really that cheesy thing of like, how would I feel if I was part of this work? What what things would I feel uncomfortable about? Who do I need to check in on? And I think when you're working with any group of people, just being absolutely transparent, even if they're like, I don't want to be part of the whole thing, I think it will it will just ensure trust and also respect working with other sort of groups. So that's kind of what I did during it. Also, I wanted to, I asked myself, am I the right person to make the work? Because sometimes you might want to make the work, but you might need a collaborator, someone who's part of that community who will give you a deeper understanding. Can I partner with other people? So I really interrogated my intention and made sure that everybody was looked after, including myself in it. Brilliant. Um, we will show, so viewers, we will show um, a clip about uh, Body Remembers um, at the end of this talk. Um, I just thought, could you just, there's there's another aspect of you that um, the viewers might not know about, which is that you are also involved in TV and film. And um, I just wondered how... Um, with, with these sort of really important ideals that you have, um, and you have such a strong ethos um, with your work, how does that inform the, the roles that you select in film and TV? That's a great question. It's the, I think, firstly, the thing with film and TV and being an actor is that initially you get what you're given, so they just put you up for everything and then you see what sticks. But if I'm honest, because of my artistic practice, a lot of the work that I end up getting really resonates with that ethos. I think I just feel it feels more genuine and important. So you can just, I just do better in those audition rooms. Um, 
I think something about complex being complex with characters was really essential that things that the character isn't just doing one thing they're doing several things and question and, and questioning who they are in that so the last project I did was a perf um, uh, performance of noughts and crosses which talks about race and power right and supremacy and the current project I'm doing is another book adaptation called The Power and it's essentially a feminist sci-fi book about what would happen if women had the power I've read and it, it. Follows. oh yes that's the, that's what I'm doing <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so um if anyone doesn't know it follows kind of five characters all over the world and women are they have the ability to electrocute people it's not a spoiler it, they tell you right at the start so um it just shows like what would happen um when the roles are reversed but it's very complex in how it depicts that it's not saying women would be great and everything would be fantastic it really talks about any sort of dominant group with power cause destruction right and something about taking that out, out of the context of patriarchy makes it feel more sinister actually the things that the same things that which are happening now in our society happen with, with women but something about changing that context makes you really have a new understanding of power and that anybody with too much power is a threat and that power needs to be essentially for power to work it has to be equally distributed and I was just drawn to that because it was just very complex it was it's a feminist piece but it also um, is very um critical on all sorts of structures so those sort of works are just really drawn to anything complex which asks uncomfortable questions feels important yeah yeah because they there there's no kind of clear um good guy in that book they you know everybody's got a dark side on it and a and a good side and you kind of instantly like certain characters but then they they always have failings as well don't they yeah so that's great so we have um rattled on for 45 minutes nearly so I think um if we want to show Heather if you want to show your performance and um and then that will give me a little bit of time to have a look at all of these amazing Q&A questions um please if you've got any more just put put it in the Q&A um and I'll have a look at the chat bit as well perfect it's just a pre little thing so this is just a kind of promo of an R&D I did last year so this isn't actually the performance but it's a flavor of what the performance is about which hopefully will be at, at, in Bristol sometime next year fingers crossed My name is Heather Ajipong, I'm a visual artist and performer and I'm making a performance art piece called The Body Remembers. So The Body Remembers is a performance art piece about how trauma is kind of internalised in the body and how we can kind of discover or find a sense of ownership in our recovery and healing. So there's four, there's four main components to the project I would say, sound, um, projection, um, audio interviews and movement and they all really centered around interviewing these women so I interviewed um, 20 black women between the ages of 18 and like 70 and a lot of I spoke to them a lot about how trauma felt how it sounded how it looked I really wanted the piece to be as immersive as possible so projections seemed like really important for the audience to feel like like their inner body. So the idea is that trauma kind of lives in the right hemisphere of your brain and movement, non-verbal non communication is where all that is. So things like um, free writing, moving without really consciously thinking is part of the recovery and healing process. And to get to that kind of authentic movement, you have to really not be conscious of your surroundings and really just follow to what your body wants to do. 
there's kind of two components, the mover and the witness. So the mover is me moving authentically. And then the witness observes the mover in this kind of non-judgmental way, but they feel very connected to the mover. And there's a lot of questions around how the witness feels. The hope was that all the elements would elicit an emotional response because that's how authentic movement, that's kind of the whole point of it, is that the two people are kind of sharing in a really um, intense moment that the kind of goal for the project is that people can really feel so I just really want to encourage people to just attend to their bodies and really question them how they're feeling and just kind of dig into their mental health a bit more I think that's my hope Brilliant. Uh, so some <clears throat> interesting questions that have come up. If anybody wants to send over any more, please do. Um, first one wasn't really, it, it was just about um, asking about the book. Um, what was the book called? So um, did get answered, it's called The Power, but you also mentioned another book. So just in case it was that one that you were asking about, it was called The Heart of the Race. Is that right, Heather? Oh. Yes. Who's that by? Stella Dadzi and Beverly Bryan. They're nice. two former British Black Panthers who wrote that. And um, can you remember who the power is by as well? Yes, Naomi Alderman. Brilliant. Thank you. So uh, first question was, um, how did you get out there and, and get noticed at such a young age? <laughs> great question um i really try to find organizations institutions collaborators who chimes with me so i have no i have no rich uncle i've got nobody who's kind of in the know i've got none of my family in the art world i just got really um i was thinking what are my interests what are my concerns and just drew to the right organizations so one of them was autograph abp I found, um, I did, you know, sometimes they ask for, um, respond to this exhibition. I just put my work out little by little and then just built those relationships. It sounds so cheesy, but building those relationships felt so important. Relationships, which I thought weren't that significant at the time. Suddenly I got a call back and someone's like, I'm working at Welcome. And I'm like, oh my gosh, and I can work with them. So it was really doing that. Um, yeah, establishing relationships as little as, as can be, I think. Fantastic. And it's really great that you've, um, it sounds like you've got a really strong relationship with um, the Hyman collection, James Hyman in particular. Yes, James Hyman has just been, oh, what a fantastic man. Yeah, because <laughs> the, tr the truth is, I think it's, this is the honest thing, I never hear artists talk about being kind of either working class or being, um, not having disposable income. Sometimes you're, when you're trying to make projects, it's very difficult to finance it, especially if it's um, kind of performance work. So trying to find like interesting commissions and James really uh, saw something in my work and offered me that commission at the exact right point when I had an idea. So um, places like the Heinemann Foundation, I think in the future will start doing kind of initiatives where they're giving small grants and bursaries to artists coming up and I think not necessarily of have, um, having to have gone to uh, art school or anything like that. I didn't go to art school right I just did a psychology degree and did that scholarship at Goldsmith so finding foundations and organizations like that especially right now everyone there is so much people are really trying to kind of get new voices in so um, yeah Hyman Foundation are, are doing great work and there's a lot of other organizations which are doing similar sort of things. Yeah, sometimes you just need one that one person to believe in you and just yep. sort of boost your confidence to feel like, oh, okay, I, I can do this. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, can you talk about um, what some of your future projects are looking like? Oh, gosh, what a great question. So Body Remembers, so you've just seen that R&D, guys, that's going to change and like I said, become very immersive about the audience. So that's happening now, the power. Um, I think my practice is gonna change. It feels like 
there's a kind of end of a chapter with my work, this sort of, I'm really interested in reimagination, but right now, not so much of just historical figures. I'm thinking of ideas and objects now and objects of significance. So I think my work is going to be a bit more conceptual, but still about, still around, um, still around a, a sense of uh, empowerment in the work. But I think it's going to be a little bit more conceptual. Yeah, I think it's just this practice feels like I'm making it up as I go along. So I'm just trying to f keep evolving it, and and also it, it comes. My work comes from a place of truth so I'm not just making a lovely image I'm trying to understand something more about myself so as I kind of grow and develop I think my work will keep growing and developing yeah do you think um you look into doing more collaborations as well because it sounds like you've you've really got so much out of this collaboration with Imogen Knight um yeah is that something you you might go into absolutely I think there's going to be more, even though I'm an actor and I feel really confident in that, performance work feels incredibly exciting now. Um, and I think more of, without, so Image and Night, um, there's quite a few collaborators, but my two co-creators are Image and Night and Gail Babb, who is a um, wonderful dramaturg. I think sometimes because the work is just centered on me, it is quite specific in details that I want to have a bit of um I think different ideas and inputs makes the work makes the work richer I just need to find a team who I feel safe with but with those those with, with those kind of cared collaborations the work just feels there's a new life to the work a new breath to the work it's specific but also universal that's what it feels like with collaboration so definitely Coco yeah brilliant I think that is it unless anyone's got a final burning question and oh there was one saying um where did you find those costumes for the oh that's a good question <laughs> so um oh all over the place <laughs> so i usually have a good relationship with um national theater costume department in um in south london so usually i start there they've got you can basically get anything you've seen at National Theatre. It's there. and You can just rent it. It's mad. Yeah. Wow. That's where I've got the little crown from. Yeah. Mm. All, all National Theatre. And then the journey kind of springs off from there. So it's just costume shops. So that takes a big chunk of time finding the right um, prop. Often I'm not using the exact props that there are in the images, but in the, the props which feel important to what I'm saying right now. It's just looking at thrift stores, National Theatre, costume shops big old mission but yeah nice I'd love that bow I'd love sifting through all those costumes That's just so much fun. <laughs> okay uh thank you so much Heather that was absolutely brilliant and um yeah I'm so delighted to be working with you and um it's just been uh, really nice to to work with an artist that's got such a strong socially engaged practice and is really interested in um, how the audience are going to perceive their work. Mm. So thank you. Yeah, it feels it feels like the Arnold Feeney right now is the perfect place to actually debut my work because I've I've actually the work has never been seen in real life in any museum or gallery, and I think the work around because the show was curated with all sorts of people to creating the show and a real push to how the audience are experiencing that. And I think that's just beautiful. And it feels really, I'm really glad that the work opened at the Arnold Feeney on the third. It just feels significant to the ethos of the project really. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much to the um, audience for joining. And yes, just to you. remind you that next week we've got uh, another talk this time by Imran Peretta. And then that will be it for this year. And then it will restart again next year. Um, and also, I think I'm right in saying that this um, has been recorded. So it will be available online on our website soon. Okay. 
Thanks for joining. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.